you very much. Is the it's unmuted and everything? Yeah, is all okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, so thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, you asked me to talk on psychoanalysis and mysticism uh, in a short time. So let me try to give you some of my uh, in it, impressions on that. Now, the existence of a deep gulf between psychoanalysis and the Indian mystical traditions is of special interest to an Indian psychoanalyst. Unlike his Western counterpart, the Indian psychoanalyst has sometimes or the other consciously faced and reflected on the conflict between an absorbing intellectual orientation, psychoanalysis, which is the mainstay of his professional identity, and the working of a historical fate which has made the mystical the distinct light motif of his Indian cultural tradition and thus a part of his cultural unconscious. Let me begin with what is common to both mysticism and psychoanalysis. They are both ways of inner transformation. The mystical path, of course, is more ancient, universal, and highly regarded even when in many countries at different historical times, its practitioners have often lived in an uneasy truce, if not frank antagonism with the established religion of their societies. What divides psychoanalysis and mysticism are their diverging goals of inner transformation. What that transformation should look like. Let me first take the goal of psychoanalysis. The psychoanalytic goal is to lead to an outcome where the person, through an increased self-understanding by making the unconscious conscious, attains a freedom to love, work, and play, free from inhibitions her mind has gathered over the life cycle, especially the childhood years. You can also say, one of the aims of psychoanalysis is increasing a person's choices. It is important to note that essential to psychoanalysis is a view that the process of self-understanding or what it calls insight of coming to know oneself or even of attempting to do so is the unique satisfaction that psychoanalytic therapy has to offer. Coming to mysticism, we usually equate mysticism with what I would call the peak mystical experience. The peak experience is said to be characterized by an expansion of consciousness that fills the external world, which appears to be pervaded by a oneness of existence. The overwhelming feeling is of the world having at last become transparent and more real than its conventional reality. All of this is accompanied by height, heightened bodily sensations and a great feeling of pleasure or rather bliss, ananda, which absorbs all other experience. Variously called cosmic consciousness, peak experience, Mahabhava, it is the Samadhi of the Hindus, Satori of Zen Buddhism, Fana of the Sufis, is there nothing common here between psychoanalysis and mysticism? I like to think of mysticism not only in terms of a peak experience, but as a mountain climb with many base camps marking progress on the way. The first camp from which one cannot see the summit, covered as it is by clouds, though we know it is there, is tolerance. Defined minimally as giving the benefit of doubt to others. The second camp, a little higher, can be said to be compassion. While the third and the last camp, from where one climbs to the summit, is empathy, the feeling into another person. Although, of course, empathy can also encompass a feeling into nature. The point is that the spiritual climb fosters deeper and deeper feelings of connectedness, 
although only a few rare saints can reach the summit, the peak experience. Most of us can consider ourselves fortunate if we can catch a glimpse of the peak from the base camps of tolerance, compassion, and empathy. We need to recognize that psychoanalysis too is a spiritual climb in so far as it makes these base camps accessible, even when it prefers to stop short or negates the existence of a summit. It seems to me that one reason for the friction between psychoanalysis and mysticism arises from the fact that they essentially cultivate the same field, what is called the self, and with not dissimilar methods that attempt to look inwards. Mutual irritation is bound to follow as the two keep on bumping against each other. Historically, the psychoanalytic practice of healing, what was at that time called soul disturbances, was too near that of numerous occultists and faith healers who operated at the fringes of the established churches in Europe. The psychoanalytic method was too close to older introspective techniques that drew their sustenance from religion. Craving respectability as a science, it is understandable that psychoanalysis would seek to sharply demarcate its boundaries and differentiate its methods from comparable mystical techniques that antedated so vastly in the history of human consciousness. Besides the vagaries of history and the imperatives of its own evolution, I believe the antipathy of psychoanalysis towards mysticism has been largely precipitated by their different worldviews, or as I prefer to call it, their different visions of reality. Disseminated through myths and legends, proverbs and metaphors, enacted in religious rituals, conveyed through tales told to children, given a modern form in films, glimpsed in admonitions of parents, as also in the future vistas they hold out to their children, a vision of reality is absorbed from early on in life, not via the logic of the head, but via the emotional stirrings of the heart and the body in which this cultural reality is encoded. These are not philosophical doctrines that are relevant only for religious and intellectual elites, but beliefs and attitudes, many of them not conscious, that are reflected in the lives, songs, and stories of a vast number of people who share a common culture. It is the vision of reality that interprets central human experiences and answers perennial questions on what is good and what is evil, what is real and what is unreal, what is the essential nature of men and women and the world they live in, and what is a person's connection to nature, to other human beings, and to the cosmos. The psychoanalytic vision of reality is primarily a tragic one. It is tragic insofar as it sees human experience pervaded by uncertainties and absurdities where a person has little choice but to bear the burden of unanswerable questions, inescapable conflicts, and incomprehensible afflictions of fate. Life in this vision is a linear movement which cannot be undone. Many wishes remain fated to be unfulfilled and ungratified. On the other hand, the Indian mystical vision of reality offers a romantic quest, a goal. Life's journey is a search and the seeker, if he or she withstands all the perils of the road will be rewarded by an exaltation beyond normal human experience, an access to a higher consciousness than the one mediated by our senses. Trapped in their respective visions of reality, psychoanalysts and mystics have generally shown a mutual disdain. If Freud saw the mystic feeling 
of unity, he called it the oceanic feeling, the feeling of unity with the cosmos as the limitless primary narcissism of the infant united with the mother at the breast. Siri Aurobindo peevishly observed that he finds, again a quote, difficult to take psychoanalysis seriously, that one cannot discover the meaning of the lotus by the secrets of the mud in which it grows. And that as a science, psychoanalysis is in its infancy, inconsiderate, awkward, and rudimentary at one and the same time. Reading observations of mystics about psychoanalysis and about psychoanalysis about mysticism, one cannot escape the conclusion that both are fueled by a vast ignorance about the other. Perhaps the most fundamental difference between psychoanalysis and mysticism lies in their irreconcilable understanding of what constitutes consciousness. Psychoanalysis subscribes to the current scientific consensus driven by developments in the neurosciences that sees consciousness as an epiphenomena of brain processes, so that with brain death, all consciousness is forever extinguished. In the mainstream of mystical thought is the idea of a personal consciousness being part of a universal consciousness from which this individual personal consciousness emerges at birth and into which it ultimately, after many lives, dissolves at death. In more modern language, one would say that for mystics, the brain is but a filter through which the universal consciousness, cosmic self, filters in space-time to form individual personal selves. In the mystical model, my individual consciousness is not an emergent, fragile property of my brain processes, as conventional neurosciences would have it, but exists independently of the brain that has filtered it through neurological, cognitive, cultural, and social processes. Consciousness does not originate in the brain, which is but a filter. Mystics, it is believed, can bypass this filter and tap into universal consciousness. Even if the two models of consciousness are irreconcilable, are there ways that psychoanalysis and mysticism can still learn from each other? My answer is a qualified yes. For mysticism, it would be helpful to have the criteria to distinguish, in spite of surface resemblances, resemblances a genuine seeker or an adept from someone who is suffering from mental illness, a person for whom mysticism is but a way station, a last defense against impending mental disintegration. Spiritual teachers also need to realize that even the most powerful and transformative spiritual experiences do not completely rearrange the psyche. A self that has been developing since birth and is so to speak physiologically embedded deep in the neuronal networks of the brain cannot be wiped out by even the most powerful mystical experience. This experience may create new neuronal pathways without, however, erasing the old ones. In times of personal crisis, brought on by great psychological stress or serious illness in old age, there may be an automatic regression to the earlier self as its cutoff parts or unresolved psychological conflicts once, once again demand a hearing. This is a possibility to which neither the mystic nor the seeker is immune. It is especially at these times that mystical traditions need to welcome psychoanalysis, which more than other, many other psychotherapy shares their quest for the growth of wisdom and the realization of a higher self. They need to understand the psychoanalytic viewpoint that psychological pain need first not to be eliminated, but understood. Elimination or reduction of suffering 
is then a byproduct or a consequence of understanding. From this perspective, depression is less like a tumor and more like a stabbing pain in your abdomen. It is telling you something and you need to find out what. The American poet Emily Dickinson observes, the heart cannot forget unless it contemplates what it declines. This sentiment is also echoed by the Sufi poet Rumi. Don't turn away, keep looking at the bandaged place. That is where the light enters you. I wonder here whether the meditation techniques of mystical traditions, where the emphasis is often on witnessing rather than understanding the working of the mind are adequate in preparing most people's minds for achieving the mystical goals. Whether what has been often identified as the chief obstacle in the mystical path, the workings mostly unconscious of desire can be bypassed through any one of the mystical sadhanas. Here, I would align myself with Jiddu Krishnamurti, a most reluctant guru who observed, and I quote him, now desire, contrary to general belief, is the most precious possession of man. It is the eternal flame of life. It is life itself. When its nature and functions are not understood, however, it becomes cruel, tyrannical, bestial, stupid. Therefore, your business is not to kill desire as most spiritual people in the world are trying to do, but to understand it. If you kill your desire, you are like the withered branch of a lovely tree. Desire must keep growing and find out its true meaning through conflict and friction. Only by the continuance of the conflict can understanding come. This is what most people do not see. As soon as the conflict comes and the sorrow born of conflict, they at once seek comfort. Comfort in its turn breeds fear. Fear leads to imitation and the sheltering behind established tradition. From this come rigid systems of morality, laying down what is spiritual and what is not spiritual, what is religious life and what is not the religious life. It is the fear of life which produces guides, teachers, gurus, churches, religions. Please, I know. This is the quote, ending of the quote. It can only be helpful to an aspiring mystic to familiarize himself or herself with the various disguises of desire psychoanalysis has uncovered, including the ones in our dreams. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Where psychoanalysis can contribute most to mysticism is by throwing light on some psychological threats faced by gurus which they need to negotiate in their own lives before they can helpfully guide their disciples. As someone believed to be in possession of a higher consciousness or being in touch with higher powers, a guru, often now they call the God man, is often regarded with awe and reverence in the Indian context. This was not always the case. In Vedic times, 1500 to 500 before the common era, when a human being's encounter with the sacred mysteries took place through ritual, the guru was more a guide to their correct performance and an instructor in religious duties. A teacher deserving of respect and a measure of obedience, he was not yet the mysterious figure of awe and venerated incarnation of divinity. In the later Upanishadic era, 800 to 500 before the common era, the polar shift begins as the person of the guru starts to replace Vedic rituals as the path to spiritual liberation. He now changes from a knower and dweller in Brahman to being the only conduit to Brahman. Yet the Upanishadic guru is still recognizably human, a teacher of acute intellect, astute and compassionate, demanding from the disciple the exercise of his reason rather than exercises in submission and blind surrender. 
Here the ideal of the Hindu guru was not too far removed from the Buddhist master who too constructed experience near situations to illustrate a teaching and who saw the master-disciple relationship as one of potential equals with spiritual insight as its goal. The change from the teacher image of the guru received its greatest momentum with the rise of bhakti cults in both North and South India, starting from sixth century after the common era. Devotional surrender on part of the disciple with such figures as the worship of guru's feet, bodily prostration and other forms of veneration and divine grace on part of the guru mark the guru-disciple relationship. The guru is now an extraordinary figure of mystery and power, the God-man. Guru is Brahma, Guru is Vishnu, Guru is Maheshwa is a verse familiar to many Hindus. It is forgotten that the mystic guru may know Brahman, but that is all he knows, not physics, not stockbroking, not neurosciences. There are not many gurus who are aware of the psychological danger posed by this massive idealization of their person by the disciple. A danger that increases exponentially with the number of one's followers and one's prominence as a guru. Negative feelings and the malignant projections of other towards oneself are easier to handle. It's easier to for me to handle if you abuse me. They cause severe psychological discomfort, yes. Compel, but they compel us to reject them by discriminating inside between what belongs to us and what other people are projecting onto us. This painful motivation for repelling the invasion of the self by others does not exist when such projections are very gratifying to our narcissism, to our self-esteem, as they are invariably in case of adoring followers. Who doesn't like to hear how great you are, how wonderful, how loving, how wise you are. It is difficult not to at least smell the incense, incense smoke being burnt at your altar by so many pro proclaiming your greatness. A retreat into a feeling of omnipotent grandiosity, while in the sexual sphere, a retreat into sexual perversion has been reported often enough to constitute a specific danger of the guru role. It is sad to hear or read reliable reports about 70-year-old gurus who become peeping toms as they <clears throat> arrange with all the cunning of a warrior to spy on their teenage female disciples, generally Western, undressing for the night in the ashram. The promiscuity of some other gurus, pathetically effortful in the case of elderly bodies with a tendency to flag, is also too well known to merit further repetition. On its part, psychoanalysis too has much to learn from mystical practices in fine tuning and increasing the sophistication of its own methods in the clinical setting. First, in psychoanalytic therapy, one seeks access to the client's unconscious through methods such as free association, that is saying whatever comes to the mind, paying attention to the client's slips of the tongue, hesitations, dreams, fantasies, and to what is going on unconsciously between the client and the therapist. Language and words play a vital role in psychoanalytic therapy. From the mystical perspective and its emphasis on direct experience, language and words distract us from this direct experience. They create distance from the immediacy of experience in order to do the cognitive work necessary for communication to the therapist. This disdain for language is shared by most mystical traditions. The 16th century Saint Dadu puts it this way, I quote, the guru speaks first to the mind, then with the glance of the eye. If the disciple fails to understand, he instructs him at last by mouth. Sir, he sir, that to address, yeah, uh, we have a couple of minutes for winding up the session, sir. Thank you. 
He that understands the spoken word is a common man. He that interprets the gesture is an initiate. He that reads the thought of the mind unsearchable, unfathomable is God. Here psychoanalysis diverges from mysticism, but it can heed mysticism's warnings on the limitations of language and become much more sensitive to the nuances of silence and other nonverbal communication in the therapy setting. Second, the analyst recommended psychic state when he's listening to the patient is supposed to be an evenly suspending, suspended free floating attention. When examined closely, this free floating attention seems to be as much if not more belong to the meditative practices of mystical tradition. Consider for instance, Freud's description of the therapist's psychic state as he listens to the patient. I quote, experience soon showed that the attitude which the analyst could most advantageously adopt was to surrender himself to his own unconscious mental activity in a state of evenly suspended attention to avoid as far as possible reflection and the construction of conscious expectations, not to try fix anything that he heard particularly in his memory. And by these means catch the drift of the patient's unconscious with his own unconscious. In such comparisons and descriptions, expert meditators will not fail to recognize advanced stages of meditative contemplation in certain Hindu and Buddhist mystical disciplines, such as the Shamta practice of sitting meditation without object and goal. And if, as has been reported, meditation increases one's empathy, then I can imagine a meditative practice also becoming part of a budding psychoanalyst training, since empathy also constitutes the foundation of psychoanalytic work with the patient, essential for gathering data for interpretations made by the analyst. So in conclusion, in spite of their divergences and goals, visions of reality and views of the self, psychoanalysis and mysticism can indeed profitably learn from each other as far as their practices are concerned. Thank you.